that for the last hundred and fifty years or so the united states government in its wisdom has decided that latin america should be a colony of the united states government and that countries which attempt to stand up and do things for their own people rather than for american corporations are not to be tolerated. What's going on in Nicaragua today, it's not important to get into all the details of whether the Sandinistas are right or wrong on this issue. If we understand that in the last 30 years, the United States has overthrown governments in Guatemala, the Dominican Republic, they murdered Salvador Allende in Chile, they've overthrown the government of Grenada, they attempted to overthrow the government of Cuba, they overthrew a government in Brazil, and now they are attempting to overthrow the government of Nicaragua. I think, although all of you know that I am no great supporter of the President of the United States, I think one thing that we can say for him is that he's an honest and straightforward man. What he has said to Daniel Ortega and the people of Nicaragua, he has not gotten involved in these wishy-washy terms of liberalism or international law. He's been quite upfront about it. And he said before the people of the world that if you wish to survive as a nation, you can. All that you have to do is get down on your hands and knees and say, uncle. That's all. That's an interesting principle of international relations. The basic crime being committed by the people of Nicaragua today is that the government there has the strange and unusual idea that they should attempt to do something for the people of Nicaragua rather than for the United States corporations. It's a very strange idea for an independent nation to have. And if the history of the United States' relationship to Latin America for the last 50 years, which is Somoza, yes, Ortega, no, Batista, yes, Castro, no, Pinochet, mass murderer, torturer, destroyer of democracy, yes, loans, military money, yes, Salvador Allende, democratically elected by the people of Chile, his political party gaining in strength, no, overthrown by the CIA and murdered, and 30,000, 40,000 Chileans killed. Yes, Pinochet. It means that we believe that human beings on a face-to-face -face level are able to communicate with each, a with each other, are able to work out problems based on mutual respect, and that as Americans, what we want of our nation, we want our nation to be bold and brave, but not with guns and not with machine guns and not with nap napalm. I personally, really, I'm not all that impressed by President Reagan's tough, warlike rhetoric. If he wants to do something that's really gutsy and that it's really brave for a guy who does so well on the television, the master of the media, what I would do is challenge him to sit down before the television cameras of the entire world and sit down and talk to Ortega and the other people in Nicaragua and work out the problems based on mutual respect. Does he have the guts to do that? And I'm not sure that he does. I'm not sure that he has the answers to the sharp questions and the challenges that people throughout the third world would be throwing to him. You know, we live in a world today, and it really is depressing to think about it. We live in a world today where there are several hundred million people starving to death. They're starving to death right now. We live in a world where my guess is that between all the superpowers and the other nations of the world, close to one trillion dollars are being spent every single year on weapons, on more and more nuclear bombs, on the most sophisticated nerve gases which can wipe people out and paralyze them. And yet, with all the brilliance and all the fine technology and all the robots and the great medical research that they do up there in the hospital and all the other hospitals, Civilization hasn't advanced one bloody iota for the last thousands of years. All that these people can do is still say to each other, we're strong, you're weak, you do it our way, or we're going to kill you. A very profound 
civilized remark. I think what we're here today is to show President Reagan and many people who don't have the courage that we have. Because what goes on in this country, primarily through the television and through the media, is that over and over again, all that the President of the United States has to say is that Nicaragua is communist, Nicaragua is Marxist-Leninist, and now the new thing is Nicaragua is terrorist. And if you say it over a hundred times, it now becomes truthful. And then suddenly you see the professional politicians getting less and less old in saying that maybe the president is wrong. Because you know, pe appealing to people's hatred and their anger and their desire for revenge is very good politics. The truth of the matter is, it has always worked. And it's probably working today. And you're gonna find many college teachers a little bit less likely to speak out against it. Social workers a little bit like, less likely to speak out against the imperialism that now goes on. And I think what our task is here in Burlington, Vermont, and in the other communities that have sister city relations, is to say that we ain't afraid of that and that we reject that mentality. That what the real challenge of civilization today is, and the challenge of the United States is, and it's an enormous challenge, and it's a difficult challenge, and no one has any easy answers. But the real challenge is, in a world which is economically disintegrating, the conditions in the third world today are as bad as they have ever, ever, ever been. And the challenge is, the challenge for tough people, Mr. Reagan this, thinks he's tough, the challenge for a tough person and for a tough society is how do we use our resources, our incredible wealth, our energy, not in military adventurism, but in working with people throughout the entire third world, working with the people in Nicaragua, in cooperation and in mutual respect, working with them so children don't have to starve to death, don't have to die of diseases, which these people up there on the hill in our hospital know the answers to, where people can learn to read and write, can learn to relate to each other. That's the challenge that we face. And the guns and the bombs and the Contras are going in exactly the wrong, dire the wrong direction. What the Sister City program is to me is a human way to say to the people in Nicaragua, we are concerned about your problems, we respect you as human beings, and we want to work with you cooperatively to build a decent world. Thank you. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Greenspan, I have uh, four brief questions that I, <clears throat> that I appreciate your responding to. 30% uh, of American workers earn poverty or near poverty wages. Uh, in fact, uh, low wage workers in the United States are now the lowest paid uh, low wage workers in the industrialized world. Uh, the minimum wage, as you know, is now $5.15 an hour. If it had kept pace with inflation from 1968, it would now be $7.33 an hour. Uh, many of us believe that it's important to protect low-wage workers and to raise the minimum wage so that nobody in this country who works 40 hours a week lives in poverty. Uh, could you make a recommendation to Congress in your judgment should the minimum wage be raised? I do not. Uh, the reason I do not, strangely enough, uh, Congressman, starts off with the same premise that you did, namely that uh, I, too, am chagrined about the extent of dispersion of incomes in this country. And as I've said many times uh, publicly, you cannot have an effective society unless you have the assent of all parties in it that the system is fair. And my concern about the minimum wage is it does not do what you suggest it does. I, I would I, respectfully suggest the evidence. Well, I understand that. Let me, I'll give you my reason. And I have three other questions. So I, I, you don't surprise me by telling me that you're against raising the minimum wage. Let me ask you the second question, and you can Fair elaborate. Me. And I, I apologize. We just don't it's have okay, a whole lot fine. of time. As you know, and I think agree with, the United States has the most unfair distribution of wealth and income in the industrialized world with the richest 1% owning 40% of our wealth, more than the bottom 95%. Meanwhile, 20% of our children 
live in poverty. We have millions of people who are experiencing hunger. We have some homelessness. People can't afford health insurance, can't afford to send their kids to college. Could you briefly tell us what policies you would recommend to Congress to do away with or, or, or ease this, this disparity of wealth that we are currently experiencing? Let me start, Congressman, by saying what I would not suggest. And what I would not suggest is means which would somehow obliterate the wealth of those who are in the upper income groups or upper asset groups, because there's no evidence to suggest at all that if you were to take uh, the top 20, 50, 100, 500 people and essentially eliminate all the wealth that they had, that, would, that, that that would improve the standard of living of anybody. So merely obliterating wealth or merely confiscating wealth strikes me as a wholly uh, uh, inappropriate policy if the purpose uh, is to achieve higher standards of living. But I think nobody is talking media. about obliterating or confiscating wealth. We're talking about fairness and the appropriateness of one person having $80 billion in personal wealth while children go hungry. My third question, Mr. Greenspan, is uh, are you concerned, I know that you played an active role uh, as chair of the Fed Reserve in orchestrating a bailout of the $5 billion hedge fund known as long-term capital. And you came before our committee and what you had to say was very interesting. Are you concerned about such mergers as Travelers Insurance and Citicorp when they form a company with assets of almost $700 billion, 140 times as large as long-term capital. What happens if they fail? Who in God's name is going to bail them out? Are you concerned about that? First of all, let me just say that uh, we don't consider that uh, uh, bringing in private investors into the long-term capital management uh, problem was a bailout. It was their money, their interest, and all we did was to offer them an office space to come around. But you were concerned. Hmm? That you were very concerned about the implications oh, of I failure. Oh, indeed, I certainly was. If you were concerned about that failure, what about a failure of a company which is... We would be concerned about a failure of any large institution. But let me suggest further. We do not believe that in the event that it turns out that a substantial institution fails that they should be bailed out. In effect, what we may conclude for purposes of stabilizing the system, that an orderly liquidation of an institution is far superior to in letting it crash with all of the implications that would occur. That would mean, of course, that all equity owners are out. It would mean that perhaps some debt Venture owners alike would be, uh, have losses. Uh, our notion would not be the question of perceiving that an institution is too big to fail and that therefore gets government support. Mr. Gray, I apologize again. Let me ask you my last question, and I, I don't mean to be rude here, but... Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Sanders, this last question will have to be answered in writing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Greenspan, in your own Federal Reserve report, results from the 1998 survey of consumer finances, which you guys publish, uh, and you look on page five in the statistics of uh, before tax mean family income, what it shows is that for all families earning less than $100,000 a year, in fact, the mean family income went down between 95 and 98. That's page five. The people earning over $100,000 a year went up. Given that reality, I don't know how we keep talking about a booming economy if only the people on the top are doing quite so well. Well, I hate to trash some of the data that we collect, but uh, this is a sample mean, and we've got far superior data for the aggregate of the mean. You're I criticizing think, the, your own data that no, comes out in your um, own report. The, the problem basically is that uh, it is re these are sample statistics. Sometimes you find that uh, if the purpose of this is the distribution 
which it is. I mean, I agree with your conclusion about the distribution. I just wanted to point out that the actual real median family income between 1995 and 1998 actually went up. For everybody, for everybody. but not for people on $100,000 a year uh, or less. All I would say to you is I think our data are accurate in a relative sense, and the conclusion you draw I don't find objection to. I just wanted to raise the issue. Okay, I'm using your statistics, sir. Okay. Time of the gentleman thank is expired. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my friend from New Jersey for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I don't think any member of this body disagrees that Saddam Hussein is a tyrant, a murderer, and a man who has started two wars. He is clearly someone who cannot be trusted or believed. The question, Mr. Speaker, is not whether we like Saddam Hussein or not. The question is whether he represents an imminent threat to the American people and whether a unilateral American invasion of Iraq will do more harm than good. Mr. Speaker, the front page of the Washington Post today reported that all relevant U.S. intelligence agencies now say, despite what we have heard from the White House, that, quote, Saddam Hussein is unlikely to initiate a chemical or biological attack against the United States, end quote. Even more importantly, our intelligence agencies say that should Saddam conclude that a U.S.-led attack could no longer be deterred, he might, at that point, launch a chemical or biological counterattack. In other words, there is more danger of an attack on the United States if we launch a precipitous invasion. Mr. Speaker, I do not know why the President feels, despite what our intelligence agencies are saying, that it is so important to pass a resolution of this magnitude this week, and why it is necessary to go forward without the support of the United, States, United Nations and our major allies, including those who are fighting side by side with us in the war on terrorism. But I do fear that as a part of this process, the President is ignoring some of the most pressing economic issues affecting the well-being of ordinary Americans. There has been virtually no public discussion about the stock market's loss of trillions of dollars over the last few years and that millions of Americans have seen the retirement benefits for which they have worked their entire lives disappear. When are we going to address that issue? This country today has a $340 billion trade deficit and we have lost 10 percent of our manufacturing jobs in the last four years, two million decent paying jobs. The average American worker today is working longer hours for lower wages than 25 years ago. When are we going to address that issue? Mr. Speaker, poverty in this country is increasing and median family income is declining. Throughout this country, family farmers are being driven off of the land and veterans, the people who have put their lives on the line to defend us, are unable to get the health care and other, other benefits they were promised because of government underfunding. When are we going to tackle these issues and many other important issues that are of such deep concern to Americans? Mr. Speaker, in the brief time I have, let me give you five reasons why I'm opposed to giving the President a blank check to launch a unilateral invasion and occupation of Iraq and why I will vote against this resolution. One, I have not heard any estimates of how many young American men and women might die in such a war or how many tens of thousands of women and children in Iraq might also be killed. As a caring nation, we should do everything we can to prevent the horrible suffering that a war will cause. War must be the last recourse in international relations, not the first. Second, I am deeply concerned about the precedent that a unilateral invasion of Iraq could establish in terms of international law and the role of the United Nations. If President Bush believes that the U.S. can go to war at any time against any nation, what moral or legal obligation could our government raise if another country chose to do the same thing? Third, the United States is now involved in a very difficult war against international terrorism, as we learned tragically on September 11th. We are opposed by Osama bin Laden and religious fanatics who are prepared to engage in a kind of warfare that we have never experienced before. I agree with Brent Scrowcroft, Republican former National Security Advisor for President George Bush Sr., who stated, and I quote, an attack on Iraq at this time would seriously jeopardize, if not destroy, the global counter-terrorist campaign we have undertaken, end quote. 
forth at a time when this country has a six trillion dollar national debt and a growing deficit we should be clear that a war and a long term american occupation of iraq could be extremely expensive fifth i am concerned about the problems of so called unintended consequences who will govern iraq when saddam hussein is removed and what role will the us play in an, in an ensuing civil war that could develop in that country Will moderate governments in the region who have large Islamic fundamentalist populations be overthrown and replaced by extremists? Will the bloody conflict between Israel and the Palestinian Authority be exacerbated? And these are just a few of the questions that remain unanswered. If a unilateral American invasion of Iraq is not the best approach, what should we do? In my view, the U.S. must work with the United Nations to make certain, within clearly defined timelines, that the U.N. inspectors are allowed to do their jobs. These inspectors should undertake an unfettered search for Iraqi weapons of mass destruction and destroy them when found pursuant to past UN resolutions. If Iraq resists inspection and elimination of stockpiled weapons, we should stand ready to assist the UN in forcing compliance. I thank the gentleman.